All right, so we're going to kick it off. Uh, my name's Esteban, uh, and my talk is titled Ducky in the Middle, Injecting Keystrokes into Plain Text Protocols. Uh, so I'm a penetration tester at Coal Fire Labs. You might have saw our booth out there. We do uh, pen testing and a bunch of other InfoSec consulting services. Uh, I run a blog uh, part-time, you know, do a little uh, security research on the side. And that's what this talk is going to be about, is just kind of some stuff I did on my own time. Uh, previously, uh, I worked, uh, I was enlisted U.S. Air Force. Uh, I also worked at Apple uh, down in Cupertino, California. Uh, so if you're wondering what the title meant, maybe you, you weren't familiar, uh, the title is a reference to the USB rubber ducky, which is a pen test tool. And what it does basically is you plug it into a computer and it emulates a keyboard and it will start sending keystrokes to the system. Uh, and one of the big, cool things you can do with that is you can open up the command prompt, uh, put in a payload on the command line, and get a reverse shell. So kind of going in that same, in that same vein uh, with this attack, what this is going to be talking about is taking protocols, network protocols, that by design send keystrokes to a system, and we're going to use that uh, to do an attack similar to USB rubber ducky. Uh, so in order for this to work, the protocol needs to uh, have keystrokes sent to the system, and it needs to be not encrypted. Um, so here's an example if you've never seen a USB rubber ducky, basically how it works. So you have a computer unlocked, uh, open, you plug in a USB stick, and what it will do is get recognized as a keyboard, open command prompt, type CMD, and in the command uh, prompt you type in you know, a, a line of code. In this case, it's a uh, Metasploit web delivery payload. So once this runs, uh, you now have a interpreter shell on this system. Uh, so it's a really quick way that you can just send keystrokes to a system real quick and gain complete access to it. Um, so when it comes to analyzing protocols, most of the work I did uh, was just in Wireshark. So if you haven't heard of it, Wireshark is a protocol analyzer, and it can parse a bunch of different protocols. Uh, you can do live analysis on the wire, and you can also use a stored PCAP. Uh, it runs on most everything, Linux, Windows, Mac. Uh, the filters are extremely powerful, uh, so when it comes to filtering uh, these packet captures, you can get to what you want. And it's free. Uh, the, the version that's free is, is full featured. So it's pretty, pretty much has everything you need for analysis. So if you haven't seen Wireshark, this is what it looks like. Uh, top pane, you have your packets. Middle pane, you have the uh, breakdown of the different layers of the packet. And on the bottom, you have the raw bytes. So just to cover some fundamentals that you need to know uh, for these types of attacks. First thing, man in the middle. Uh, if you haven't heard of it, Basically, you know, normally two systems would communicate with each other directly, but when you become the man in the middle, you're basically intercepting the communication and relaying it on both sides. And you can just relay it directly, uh, just to monitor it, or you can actually alter the contents in transit. Um, and one of the ways that you can do this, uh, you can spoof a host directly, or you can spoof the default gateway if routing in between different subnets. Uh, the most common way and simplest way uh, you can do a uh, man-in-the-middle attack is with ARP spoofing. Uh, if you've taken a networking class, you might be familiar with how ARP works, but basically uh, it resolves a layer 2 address to a layer, th layer 3 address. Um, and when a system doesn't know uh, the IP address, it'll go ask. Um, but you can also send these things called gratuitous ARPs, which uh, you're, you're updating clients ARP tables on your LAN even though they didn't ask. And if you send it, they'll just believe it. So uh, the protocol by itself uh, doesn't offer much protection. There are some network switches out there that would detect and block these types of attacks, uh, but the protocol by itself doesn't have any mitigation against spoofing. Uh, so the basics of TCP, you, you might all be familiar, but um, you know the SYNAC, uh, you know, SYN, SYNAC, ACK, um, the big thing here is the sequence numbers. So these sequence numbers keep track of state. Um, and as you send data, the sequence number will increment. And on the other side, the acknowledgement number will increment to acknowledge that the data got sent. Uh, so currently, uh, sequence numbers are what we call pseudo-random. Uh, they're, they're a relatively random value so that an, a, someone who's not part of the communication can't guess these numbers and start sending data pretending to be someone else. 
Uh, if you want to learn a little bit more about networking, I really recommend this book, uh, Practical Packet Analysis. It'll go over the basics of TCP, uh, using Wireshark, and uh, it kind of has some good, good chapters on learning how to analyze packets. Uh, so one thing I wanted to talk about was TCP session hijacking. So that's taking over an existing established TCP session. Uh, so this is something that shouldn't, that shouldn't, you shouldn't be able to do, but you can in some circumstances. Uh, if we go way back in time to the time period of Kevin Mitnick, he actually pulled off a TCP session hijack by guessing the TCP sequence number because they weren't sufficiently random, and he actually popped a shell on the box of the person who was investigating him. Uh, now these numbers are random enough that you can't really guess them, but if you can put yourself in a man in the middle, a man in the middle position in the network communication, you can sniff out those sequence and acknowledge numbers and start spoofing packets to the target. And one of the easy ways to get that man in, man in the middle position is with ARP spoofing. Uh, so TCP session hij hijacking has been around as long as TCP has, and there's been a lot of tools uh, open source that you can use to hijack a TCP session. Um, and while you can't stop someone from hijacking your TCP session, if they have man in the middle, you can effectively mitigate the negative results of that by using crypto. So if you encrypt the communication channel, even if they inject packets into the TCP session, they won't really do anything uh, because they don't know, you know, what the content is. Um, and then even if it's not fully encrypted, uh, you can use some sort of message digest or hash to protect the integrity of those packets. So uh, last word on that. So TCP hijacking is cool, um, but most of the time you don't actually need to perform a TCP session hijack to have the same effect as if you did. Um, so for example, if you were attacking Telnet, you could use TCP session hijacking to start injecting uh, commands into an existing Telnet session. But typically it would be much easier just to sniff the Telnet credentials and then start a new session. Uh, so it, it's, it's a lot more simple that way. So all the attacks that I'm going to talk about from here on out, I'm not going to use TCP session hijacking to perform them, but all of them are possible with TCP session hijacking. So the first protocol I want to talk about is VNC. Uh, it's really popular. It's similar to, you know, Microsoft's remote desktop, as in you can take control of a system. You know, you see the screen, move the mouse around, uh, type on the keyboard, and have your keystroke sent to the box. Uh, it uses this protocol called RFB, or Remote Frame Buffer. Uh, and it doesn't, none of this, the session isn't encrypted at all. Uh, not the keystrokes, the screen updates, or the mouse movements. And then the way it authenticates is it uses a password, and it uses a handshake, but it's only encrypted with DES, which is a very uh, weak and deprecated protocol. And the passwords typically are truncated to eight characters, which means they're extremely easy to brute force. Um, also, on the actual VNC server, uh, there's a file that stores the password uh, for the VNC server. And this password, too, is encrypted with DES. Um, and it doesn't even really matter that it's encrypted because all the passwords are encrypted with the same key, which is in the source code of any open source VNC client, uh, which is this one right here. Uh, so they're effectively plain text. Uh, so all, all of the, the security of that password depends on the security of that system. So if you have weak NTFS permissions, uh, that pa someone on that system can get that password. So on the wire, this is what a VNC handshake looks like. Uh, so this is a TCP stream taken out of Wireshark. And the first box, we can see the challenge. And then we can see the response from the client. This is derived from that password uh, that both the server and the client know. And once they establish, establish the connection, the client can start sending keystrokes to the server. And if you look here on that very end, they're actually just all plain text. This is just uh, ASCII right here. So if you're just looking at the network traffic, you can see all the keys uh, that the user is typing uh, through VNC. So when it comes to monitoring these keystrokes, uh, it's pretty easy. You can just get a PCAP, uh, look at it in Wireshark like that. There's also a Python tool called VNC Keylogger. Uh, there's another older tool called FOSS that you can sniff out the handshakes. 
handshakes, again, easily cracked. Des, eight characters. Uh, you can exhaust the entire key space every time. So no matter what the password is, you will always be able to recover the plain text uh, probably within an hour or two. Uh, VNC crack, you can use that to crack it. Uh, cane enable for sniffing and cracking as well. Um, so once you do get this password, if you're man in the middle, you sniff out this handshake, you crack the password, what can you do? Well, you can use a regular VNC client and you can connect to the server. But there's something a little bit better you can do, uh, and that's just connecting with something automated, sending the keystrokes, and getting out of there. So someone made a Metasploit module that does this exactly, and it's kind of cool. So what it will do is it will connect over this RFE protocol, send in keystrokes to send a um, interpreter payload, and then execute it. So right here we have Metasploit on the right on Kali Linux, and on the left we have a Windows 7 system. So the Windows 7 system is running a VNC server, and Metasploit is using that module uh, with the password enabled. So you see here we run the module, and then we open up a command prompt on the victim, and we start sending keystrokes really, really fast. And then boom, right there, interpreter session open. So just like that, uh, you don't have to spend a lot of time on the victim system. Just within a few seconds, you can completely compromise the system uh, with the interpreter session just by using the protocol to send the keystrokes. So on to my original research. I found this app uh, for my Mac and my iPhone. It was called Hippo Remote. And basically the way it worked is if you had a laptop and you wanted to use, say, your iPhone as an external trackpad, you could download this app, you know, sync it with your device, and then you could start using your phone as an external mouse or keyboard. Uh, and also boasted features such as, you know, being a password manager, which made it really interesting too. So here's kind of an example. Uh, the developer made this. You can see where they're using it kind of like a mouse. Uh, they'll move their finger around on the iPhone. Um, they'll click in the po click in the box, and they'll go and send keystrokes. In this case, it's their username and password, and they can you know log in to their stuff. So that's basically the design around it and how it works. So what I found when I was analyzing it is, if you were using it on Windows, uh, it had this thing called um, Hippo something, but it was basically a VNC server. Uh, that was just a fork of Ultra VNC. So as far as attacking it, all of that was the same. Uh, same for the Linux version, where instead of shipping a VNC client, you just use whatever VNC uh, server uh, comes with comes with your distro of Linux. But on Mac, it actually had its own app. So that's what I found uh, really interesting. So I wanted to dig in that a little bit. So when it comes to the to the app, it actually has a lot of problems even outside the network side. So the password storage, uh, the password for the server is all stored in a plist file. And if you have a Mac, you probably know that the plist files are like config files. Um, so in the launch daemon in launch agents, which is how you get something to automatically start on each login or boot up, uh, they have this plist file, which is basically XML. And the password is just in there unencrypted. And what makes it even worse than that is that these plist files are world readable by everybody. So even if you signed in as the guest account with no real privileges, you could go and look at this password so that when a high privileged user logged in, you could now start sending keystrokes to their system. And then also the actual binary itself executes as root. So if you're able to find uh, any vulnerability uh, in the application, such as like a buffer overflow or something like that, you could potentially get a root shell out of that too. So here's the plist. Uh, I know it's kind of hard to see on this screen, but the gist of it is it's got the password and plain text, and it's world readable to everybody. Um, so again, very similar to VNC, all the same flaws effectively. Here's the uh, stream. We have the challenge right there in the blue the handshake, and then we actually start sending the commands to the Mac um, using this is basically JSON that it sends. So let's say you have man in the middle and you want to sniff out uh, what someone's doing. Like say they're using the HIPAA remote and they want to log into their Pandora or their Gmail or whatever. Uh, so what you would do is you would run this tool I made. It's called uh, Angry Hippo. And basically what it does is just sits there and it looks for hippo remote traffic. So there's, yeah, it's a hippo. He's angry. You can tell by the, the angry eyes. 
Um, <laughs> so there's the handshake. You get that. And then keystrokes start coming down. Uh, if you're in the back, maybe you can't read it, but it basically says hello. You can see the key down and the key up uh, commands. Um, so, so you can sniff it out, but let's say you want to start actually sending keystrokes yourself. Well, you get you need, to, you need to get the handshake, just like VNC. So there's this sniff thing, um, or you run sniff first. You get the uh, you get the challenge from the server, and then you get the response from the client. And you can just plug these back into Angry Hippo and give it a word list, and it will go and find the plain text password for you. Uh, so in this example, I have a small word list, but I actually ran this against the Rocky word list in Kali Linux, and uh, in my single threaded Python script, I was able to iterate through every password in that word list in about five minutes. Uh, so again, cracking is really fast, even if you're using just a simple uh, single threaded Python script. So here's the cool part, right? So once you've cracked the handshake, uh, you have the password. So you can connect to this Mac system and start sending keystrokes to it. And at this point, you no longer need a man in the middle position. You just needed that man in the middle position uh, to get the plain text password. So right here, we're going to run Angry Hippo again, and we're going to put uh, open up a Netcat listener as well. So we run it, and watch closely. Boom, reverse shell, just like that. So it can be super fast. Uh, if you blink, you might miss it. Um, but just like that, you know, you can send some commands really quickly and compromise the host. So I have a little bit uh, slowed down version so you can see it. So I open the netcat listener. I run angry hippo. You can see me open spotlight, type in terminal, terminal window opens. I type in a, or the script puts in a one liner for a reverse shell, uh, backgrounds it, presses enter, closes out the terminal window. Now we don't see anything, but I have remote access to that Mac system. So if you're ever wondering if, say, I don't know if I have, if Hippo Remote is on my network and I'd like to know, well, just like almost everything on Macs, it uses Bonjour to advertise what services are there. So I here in this app, I have this thing called Bonjour Browser, and you can actually see there's Hippo Remote uh, on the network. It shows you what the host name is. It shows you what the IP address is. It shows you what port it's on. And also, if you were to take a Wireshark capture, you would be able to get that data too. Uh, so, in general, uh, you usually don't want to use VNC nowadays unless it's some upgraded version where they added crypto, because uh, by default it doesn't have that. One of the things you can do if you still want to use VNC um, is you can create an SSH tunnel uh, between one target and another and tunnel all your VNC traffic through there, uh, and that will protect it. Um, and I would just recommend not using the Hippo Connect Mac OS app if you do, uh, just because it's no longer maintained and there's really no way to secure it at all. Uh, the next thing I did uh, as far as research was I found this cool app. I actually really like it. It's called Synergy. And what it does is it allows you to share one mouse and keyboard across multiple different systems of various OSs. So if you had a Linux box, a Mac box, in a Windows box, you could use the same mouse and keyboard to move across all three screens and send commands to them. So when I started doing this research, uh, there was basically two versions of the software. There was the basic edition, which didn't have any encryption, and there was the pro version uh, that was SSL encrypted. So knowing that the basic one didn't have any encryption and people are cheap in general, I was like, okay, that's the one I'm going to look at. Um, now, after I did this research, they came out with Synergy 2, uh, which uses SSL for both the basic and pro. Uh, so now, if you were to buy it, uh, you'd be pretty relatively safe because they have encryption for both. So when it came to monitoring the keystrokes uh, for Synergy Basic, it was just like the other ones and it's super easy. So right here, uh, I have nine lines of Python, and I'm using the Scapy library. And this right here will sniff all the traffic, TCP to the default port, uh, 24800. It'll look for the DK, DK, DN string, which is the key down, and it will just print out whatever character is typed. Uh, so really, that's all you need to just start sniffing out these keystrokes if they're using Synergy. Uh, so when it came to hijacking it, it was a little bit different than the other attack paths. 
So instead of the client authenticating to the server, you actually had the server just kind of sitting there and you would configure the client to talk to it. So all the validation was happening on the client side, not the server side. Um, so again, what, what I'm going to do here is uh, I'm going to use Bonjour. Um, so one of the things that Synergy has is it has this auto config option. And what, what it will do for you is it'll say, OK, I don't know where the Synergy server is. But if I find one, I'm just going to connect to that. And it does that by using Bonjour. So what I did is I made this rogue Synergy client uh, that basically pretended to act like it was a regular Synergy server. It would accept connections from clients. And once clients connected, it would start sending keystrokes to them. So to set the stage, I have Kali Linux and PowerShell Empire on the right, which is going to be the uh, CNC. Uh, in the middle, and I know it says Rouge, sorry I can't spell, but that's the rogue Synergy server. I'm going to be running this tool I made called Dissonance, which is the fake Synergy server. And on the left side, we have the Synergy client. So what I'll do is I'll go click Auto Config. It'll find the bad server, and it'll just start accepting commands. So I start up the bad server. Uh, it's going. I go over to the left, click the Auto Config, and it just finds, since it's on the same LAN, it finds the bad server, uh, starts taking commands, open up's command prompt, starts sending. This is actually a uh, PowerShell Empire one-liner uh, for a reverse shell. And then what we can see is the, the kind of green there on the right. That's a check-in uh, on PowerShell Empire. And we now have remote access to that system. So most of the time that you run into Synergy, uh, if you do run into it, is a client and a server are already going to have an established connection. So it's unlikely that you'll be running your evil server uh, when they go to click auto config. Uh, and most likely, they'll, they'll just set up the IP of the server manually. So what you can do is if there's already an established connection, you can find out where those client and server are. Uh, you can find out their IP address. You can spoof the server and then ARP spoof the client into thinking you are that same server. And it doesn't actually validate your identity at all. So it would just think that you're that same server and start taking commands. So what we're going to do here is we have a client on the left that's already set up with the real client or the real server in the middle. And on the left, on the right side, we have the fake synergy server, the command and control server, and we're going to perform an ARP spoof. So first thing is we run uh, Dissonance, which is the name of the tool, and we look at Bonjour traffic to find the IP of the client and the server. So after we run that, in the output you can't really see it, but here's the IP addresses. Um, so we just grab those so we know what we're spoofing. Uh, I'm just using ifconfig to assume the IP of the Synergy server. And then I'm using ARP spoof to ARP spoof the client that I identified. So it now thinks that I'm that same server. Then I start up my rogue server. The client which had lost its connection now goes and reestablishes uh, with what it thinks is the original server. And then again, I can open the command prompt, start, start typing in keystrokes, and then get that PowerShell Empire stager executed on the victim system. So as far as mitigating this, um, you can always, if you have Synergy, uh, the first version, you can upgrade it to Pro, and then you have SSL encryption, or you can get Synergy 2, uh, which all forms of it are encrypted. Uh, I tried this attack with the encrypted version just to see what would happen, and actually it, it notices that the server was swapped out, and it will ask you to revalidate uh, the fingerprint of the server. So if you got this pop, if you were using Synergy and you just got this pop-up randomly, that would be a bad sign. Just like if you were SSHing into a server you always SSH into and it tells you the key changed, like that's not good. So, you know, that warning there is what you need to know that you're being intercepted. Of course, a user could always just click through this and be like, okay, I don't know what that means. So I'm going to click yes, which happens a lot. Uh, but you do have some indication that this uh, kind of bad stuff is happening. So in general, uh, when it comes to using software, you you want to make sure that the software you use has encrypted communications, uh, just because if it's, if it's unencrypted, you know they can 
sniff out anything you're doing and then potentially, you know, sniff out uh, something like this and be able to perform an attack against your system. Uh, all these tools I made, I made in Python. Um, I have them on my GitHub if you want to play with them. Um, and then a more detailed write-up is also on my blog if you're curious, like, okay, well, how exactly did you do that? You know, all the source codes there, uh, detailed of the, you know, detail of the attack path is on my blog. Uh, bottom right, that's the link to my blog. I talk about a lot of the, lot of other stuff too. I'm really into, uh, Mac OS stuff and I have some more Mac OS exploitation blogs on there and then just kind of general pen testing stuff. Uh, if you've ever wanted to do research yourself, I would say, you know, jump right into it because for the most part, I did this uh, just in my free time, and I didn't really know a lot uh, when I started it. So it's actually, you know, not too bad to get into. And I just would say, if if you're interested, just go out there and, and give it a shot, because uh, you'll be surprised what you find. You know, a lot of stuff is developed in not a secure way, uh, and you can take advantage of that, you know, for fun or you know bad things if you want. Um, but that's about it. Uh, does anybody have any questions? Right. So in my screenshot, I just put the mouse movement in there uh, because it's really noisy. So if you were to put all the screen updates, there's a whole lot of data uh, that gets sent. So just to have something uh, visual there for you, like the keystrokes, which you could easily uh, see. Um, but if you were performing a man in the middle attack, you would see all the screen updates, all the mouse movements, and all the keystrokes. Uh, so so, so yeah, I filtered it, and when you look at that stream, I didn't really do anything other than send keystrokes. Like, in that example, when I did the stream, I just I didn't do anything else other than send keystrokes, just just to make the screenshot easy. Yeah, that's all right. Cool. Well, uh, if anybody wants to ask me questions after, I'll be up here for a few minutes. And thank you for your time.